There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless waves. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the Good morning. It is good to be here this morning. I've been tremendously encouraged and I've been blessed. It is good to see each one of you out here this morning. I want to welcome you to the, the further service. As it was mentioned before, I want to welcome each one of the visitors here. Feel free to worship with us. That last song, Send the Light. Are we, as we go about our life, are we sending out the light? Are we being the light of the world as Christ has called us to be? There was another song that we, we sang earlier before Sunday school that really, I just really loved the words of that song. It was, open the wells of salvation. And it goes, says, Lord, I am fondly, earnestly longing. Does that, does that, does that describe our relationship with God this morning? Are we here this morning and are we, are we fondly and earnestly longing, it says, into thy holy likeness to grow? Is that our heart and is that our passion this morning is to grow 
to be more and more holy and to be more and more to be in his likeness. It says, thirsting for more and deeper communion, yearning thy love more fully to know. I had to think of the words of the Apostle Paul there in Philippians where he talks about, and he says, Lord, he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I believe that was Paul's heart and his desire throughout his life, throughout his Christian life, was to, to know Christ more fully and to know Christ in a deeper way and to know him and the power of his resurrection. The second verse, it says, Dead to the world would I be, O Father. Is that our prayer every morning when we wake up? Is that our prayer that we could, that, that we could go through this day and we could be dead unto the world? It says, dead unto sin, but alive unto thee. It says, crucify all of the earthly within me, emptied of sin and self may I be. And the last verse, it says, I would be thine and serve thee forever, filled with thy spirit, lost in thy love. Come to my heart, Lord, come with anointing, showers of grace sent down from above. That is my heart this morning, is that our relationship with Christ can be so deep that we can become lost in his love. I'd like to turn to Psalm 119 and read a few verses. This is one of the, the lengthiest psalms I think that is written. There's like 176 verses, but don't worry, I'm not going to read all of them. Uh, I'd like to start in verse 105. And he says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I think about his word being a lamp unto my feet, I think of us going down a pathway that is dark, a pathway where we can't see very far in front of us. But do we have the confidence that, that his word is a lamp unto our feet and that his word is a light unto our path and that it will illuminate the path that we should walk on? You know, Brother Brandon this morning, he talked about fear. He talked about fear of the future, of the unknown. And I think that's something that probably a lot of us at times we deal with that. But do we have the confidence when we turn to the word that we can find comfort in that and we could, we could understand that his word is a lamp unto our feet and it is a light unto our path and that as long as we follow that path that he has laid before us, we do not need to fear. Verse 106 says, I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. Accept, I beseech thee, the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. Once again, he's, he's crying out to the Lord and he's saying, teach me thy judgments. Is that our cry this morning? Is that we cry out to God and we say, teach me, God. Teach me of your truth. Teach me of your judgments. Teach me in the way that you want me to walk. Is that our heart? My soul, in verse 109, is continually in my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. Are his testimonies, are they the rejoicing of our heart? Verse 112, I have inclined my ear to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Is he this morning our hiding place? Is he our shield when we enter into battle? Is he our shield? It says, depart from me, ye evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. I had to think of... of Joseph, I had to think of Daniel. When they were as, as young men, they were taken into captive, captivity and, 
their resolve that they had was that they would stay true to God. That was their resolve. And he says, he says, depart from me, ye evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of our God. Are we resolved in that? As we go through life, each new day that we have, that we could rise up in the morning and that we could determine that I will keep the commandments of my God. It says, uphold me according unto thy word that I may live and let me not be ashamed of my hope. Hold thou me up and I shall be safe and I will have respect unto thy statutes continually. Is that our prayer that he would hold us up and as long as he holds us up we know that we will be safe. 118, thou hast trodden down all them that err from thy statutes for their deceits their deceit is falsehood. Thou puttest away all the wicked of the earth like dross. Therefore I love thy testimonies. My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. It says, I have done judgment and justice. Leave me not to mine oppressors. Be surety for thy servant for good. Let not the proud oppress me. Mine eyes fail for thy salvation and for the word of thy righteousness. Deal with thy servant according unto thy mercy and teach me thy statutes. Once again, he's calling out and he's saying, teach me thy statutes. I am thy servant. Give me understanding that I may know thy testimonies. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. Therefore, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Can we resolve that we desire to walk in the way of the Lord, that we desire to walk according to his commandments, and that we can come to that place where we say, I hate every false way. My prayer is as I go through life that, that my relationship with Christ will continually grow deeper and deeper and that I love what Christ loves and that I hate what Christ hates. Is that our desire this morning? That's all I have to share uh, this morning. I'd like to sing a song yet before we turn the time over to Brother Felix. Uh, why don't we all stand and sing as the deer pants for the water? We haven't, we haven't sang this song in a little while, but as we think of this deer panting for the water, does that describe our hunger this morning for God's word? The second verse, it says, I want you more than gold or silver. Only you can satisfy. Have we found Christ to be the only fulfillment in our life? Have we found that he alone satisfies that hunger more than gold or silver? He says, you alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. And then the last verse says, you're my friend and you are my brother, even though you are a king. Christ this morning, he is our friend. He is also our brother. When we look at the, the doctrine of adoption, he is also our brother. But yet he is also, he is our king. Because I love you more than any other, so much more than anything. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longs after you.
Come bless the Lord. Father, we come before you this morning with thankful hearts, Lord, with hearts that are filled with gratitude and praise. We praise you, Lord, for your goodness this morning, for your love to each one of us. Pray, Lord, that you would just be with the further service this morning. Pray that you would just be with Brother Felix, Lord, that you would just use him, Lord, as a conduit for your word to flow. Just pray, Lord, that you would just be with each one that is here this morning. Pray that you would... Help us, Lord, that we could have our hearts prepared for your word and that your, that your seed, Lord, can fall upon our hearts and it can bring forth fruit that honors and glorifies you, Lord, and that can shine as a light, Lord, in the community around us. Just pray, Lord, that you would just anoint Brother Felix's lips, Lord, help and make speaking easy for him, Lord, and just bless him tremendously. Just ask all this in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be in the house of God again. It's good to be with each one of you. We say it's the house of God, but wherever two or three are gathered, that's where Jesus said he would be. Um, the building is a practicality. I, in trying to decide what to share this morning, it's kind of the same old struggle that preachers have. First of all, it's what do I share on, and then you sit there and you think about it, and, and you struggle, and then it's like at the last minute you, you have a bunch you'd like to say, and then it's like, which direction do I take exactly, and so... Anyway, here we are, and a few, I want to say weeks ago, a brother approached me, and he had a concern. He said, our, our young men need to be taught to have proper respect, and the way they conduct themselves, to have a respectful attitude, and to learn... Um, to learn that and I don't just want to target young men or children but I want to give a biblical perspective this morning on the home and I know I, I know I preached on the home not that long ago but I'd like to revisit this idea of training our children and how that comes about and talk about some of the some of the difficulties and the pitfalls that that are there for us and yeah we'll just we'll probably go several different directions but I'd like to begin in Ephesians Ephesians 5 I'm sorry Ephesians 6 Verse 1, probably the most used verse when it comes to this subject. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I want to give maybe just a little bit of context or 
yeah, historical context to this. To the Jewish ears in his audience, this concept would have been familiar. They had the, they had the Torah. They had the commands. And they had Deuteronomy 6. And um, so it was familiar to them that children need to be trained. They were commanded, you know, when you rise in the morning, when you go to bed, the word of God should be spoken, God should be revered and honored, and that parents are to be obeyed and honored. And so that was not unfamiliar to them. To the Romans, it was quite different. Um, I didn't know this, but I did a little bit of reading on, on Roman society and history. And I'm going to read just a little bit from an article that I, that I found. It says, In ancient Rome, the birth of a child was a solemn event for the household. The corona natalitia, or chaplet, was suspended over the door of the vestibule, assuming that the family was wealthy enough to have this feature in their home. In general, as in many cultures, modern times included, Romans welcomed the birth of a boy more than that of a girl. For a boy, the chaplet was made of laurel, ivy, or parsley. For a girl, it was made of wool, presaging the traditional roles of both sexes. Over the following week, several rituals took place, including an offering table for sacrifices from the mother's female friends. And notice this, the, the, the pater familias, the head of the household, had the right of life and death over newborn infants under his power, totally regardless of the wishes of the mother. This right extended to all children born to slaves in his household, as they were de facto his property. And so, when the child was born, it was laid at the feet of the head of the household, and its fate now rested in his hands. If he acknowledged the baby, it was formally accepted as a member of the family and would be given a name raised within the family. But if he refused to acknowledge the baby, it could be exposed, a procedure which seems shocking and cruel to us nowadays. In other words, they'd throw the baby out and let it die. Or they also had a place that they could take the child where it would be taken and cared for, but it would become a slave. That was... A, a practice in Roman culture if the child was not wanted. Um, and if, if it wasn't wanted even there, they would, they would expose it, just expose it, let it die, or they would drown it. And it's interesting, actually, in Roman tradition, um, the founding fathers of Rome, according to tradition, Romulus and Remus were twins, and they were unwanted, and were, according to their tradition, I don't know if it's true or not, but they were exposed and a, a female wolf supposedly raised them. So that's a little bit of history for you. So anyway, the Roman tradition was very, very cold, very uncaring. And the father had absolute authority of life and death over his family. Um, if he wished for a child to die, it would, it would die. And, and so we have... Paul preaching to Gentiles and Jews these commandments on how to raise your children. I would like to, I guess, maybe pose two, um, two divergent ideas that are, that are common in our world today, especially when it comes to, when it pertains to raising children. And the first one is, is based on modern ideas, not based on the word of God. And a lot of what is taught and accepted in modernism and in psychology today becomes a part of our, our thinking. And I just want you to, to notice that it's, 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 it's divergent. It's not, it's not the same thing as what we're taught in the Word of God. Um, for example, the modern idea, the gist, I think the gist of the modern idea is this, 
is that we are basically, as human beings, we're basically born good. And that negative behavior and negative traits are the result of improper parenting or deprivation or poor self-esteem. That's, that's usually a big one that's used a lot. And that positive behavior is, is gained by reinforcing that positive behavior, by rewarding positive behavior, but not so much by correcting the child. And that idea gained a lot of popularity back in the 50s uh, by the teaching of one uh, Dr. Benjamin Spock. You've probably heard of him. I remember hearing as a child a lot of conversations about Dr. Spock because a lot of families or some families in the Anabaptist circles were accepting his teaching and were, and were not correcting, were not physically correcting their children. They were saying spanking your child is wrong and and it destroys their self-esteem, and it's, it damages, that damages them psychologically and just brings all this emotional damage on them. It's just a bad thing. And so um, that idea has gained a lot of prevalence. As you know, in society today, you, know, you can get in trouble if the wrong people find out that you're applying you know, physical discipline to your child. And so... That, that is there. That, that exists a lot in our society. We know it's very prevalent. But it just seems like somehow they don't, they don't see the results they're getting or they don't want to acknowledge the results that they're getting. And, you know, children grow up without discipline, without good correction, without good parenting. But again, it's because of the wrong starting point. The starting point being that children are basically good and you should only reinforce good behavior. You should not apply discipline to disobedience and negative behavior, which is where the lie begins. That's where, that's where the untruth comes in, the deception. Because the, the biblical view, and I want to just acknowledge something here. Some people have taken the biblical view and have become severe with it, have become... Um, cruel with it, have not loved their children, have not treated them as created in the image of God, have not shepherded their heart, and it's created a lot of hurt, a lot of pain on that side of it. They haven't understood how to deal with this. I just, and I, I, I think a lot of times there were good intentions. A lot of times it wasn't the, in the heart of the parent to hurt a child, but I just, just, this is just incidental here. I have uh, on my mother's side of the family, there's like 15 children. My, I have a bunch of aunts and uncles and on both sides of my family. But on my mother's side, they're really close. They're a bunch of just hilarious people and they love to, to talk. And they have this huge, they have this huge uh, WhatsApp group that they let us, you know, grandkids get on. And, and they're talking on there. They grew up very poor. Uh, my grandpa Edgar and my, my grandma Bertha grew up in the Amish tradition. And my grandma was the daughter of a very well-known bishop, um, Ira Nisley. And uh, there, was, there was poverty. They, they had a lot of needs. I mean, they had 15 children back in the, you know, the 40s. And it was a struggle. My, dad, my grandpa was a carpenter. He worked hard to provide for his family. But they talk about, you know, a lot of poverty and how they just had to kind of make up their own fun as they went. But the one incident they were talking about was I had an aunt who died of leukemia when she was, I think, six or seven years old. And they were just really discussing her yesterday and the day before. And um, one of my aunts is a nurse, and she... Uh, discovered through an elderly gentleman that she was taking care of that some of their neighbors were still in the area and she found out that she knew that they were photographers from her childhood. She found out that one of the sons was still there and she went contacted him and found some pictures and she located a, a picture of her siblings with this sister that had died. She said I'd never seen a picture of her because they were Amish. They didn't have cameras. And so she got this picture and we were able to see it. 
But anyway, what I'm trying to get to is they were reminiscing about how when their, when their sister was sick that she wouldn't eat well. And, you know, my grandpa being a fairly strict disciplinarian, you know, when you come to the table, you eat your food. She wasn't eating, so he was, he was disciplining her. He was being hard on her. And it bothered the other children. Well, later he found out that she was sick and she had leukemia. And he felt so terrible. He was, he was really just apologizing to the family for the way that he had treated their little sister. And I think that's just an example of how sometimes maybe the severity in, in discipline um, could have got a little heavy, but, you know, he acknowledged it. And I think, I think in, in large part, his discipline was not wrong. It was, it was effective and it was good. Um, and I will say this, because there are mistakes made in discipline, because sometimes there are mistakes made, does not mean that the biblical model is wrong. I want to be very clear on that. Because when we, when we take mistakes that people make, and we throw out commands of Scripture because there, was, there were mistakes made, then we end up in the other ditch where we have unbiblical models and wrong thinking, and that creates disaster as well. And I want to point out some, some of the, the pitfalls. First of all, just looking at the Scripture in Ephesians 6, I'd like to get a little bit of feedback from you. I want to look at this, just home in on this, question, on this verse, verse 4. It says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. I want to just, just ask the question. And there's no, uh, well, I hear this statement, there's no wrong answers. There probably are some wrong answers, but don't be afraid to give an answer if it's something you're thinking. Um, how are some ways parents and children, how are some ways that we as, as parents can provoke our children to wrath? Just give me your thoughts. Anybody have a thought? You're afraid to share it? Dictator type. Too severe? Thank you. Anybody else? Favoritism. Favoritism. Being too proud to apologize. Okay. Sorry about my poor handwriting. Children, you can do better than that. And any anyone else? Verbal abuse. God forbid sexual Sarcasm. 
appreciate that. Anything else? Being insensitive What was the first part? Being insensitive Insensitive. Anything else? Inconsistent. <laughs> Saying one thing and doing another? Emotional absence. Emotional absence. I couldn't get you all to start, now I can't get you to quit. <laughs> Is there anybody else? Uh, this is really good. What, what's that? Punishing without all the facts. That ain't never happened to you, has it? Huh? I got a story for you. My chores were to feed the calves. <clears throat> and if the calves were bawling, they hadn't been fed right. And I was supposed to feed them as soon as I got home from school. So I got home from school, and I wanted to fix my bike first. <clears throat> so I got into the shop and took my bike tire off. And <coughs> took the tube out and I was busy trying to patch the tube and time just got away from me and dad got home and the calves are still bawling their hearts out because they hadn't been fed and he sees me in the shop fixing the bike tire he didn't even have a discussion with me he dragged me out of there and gave me a whooping he said feed them calves boy and <laughs> that hurt it was like, man, I just time just got away from me. I didn't intend to not feed him, but I should have fed him first. Anyway, so it happens. Is there anything else you want to add to this list? <clears throat> okay. Thank you. I'm going to leave it there. If you had one you wanted to share, maybe you can share it later. But I think that's a, re a really good list. I thank you for your participation. As I look at this list of ways that we can fail our children, ways that we can provoke them to anger, ways that we can create pain in their lives that results in anger and in rebellion, 
I can't help but believe that most of this stuff that we as parents fail in is a result of sin committed against us. And so the old adage, you know, don't let sin committed against you become sin in you. And I really feel like a lot of times when we as parents, we see ourselves or we hear our, our spouse or we hear others saying, hey, you should work on this. We should ask ourselves, why is it? Too often what we tend to do is just beat ourselves up and just say, oh, yeah, I know. I need to do better. I need to do better. Let's just buckle down and do better. But we, I think sometimes we should ask ourselves, why, why am I doing this? Why do I keep repeating the same behavior? What is it about me that I am acting out this way as a parent? And just do a little bit of praying, maybe, and, and talking, and maybe talking with others, and just trying to, trying to get to the root of what is really going on in here so we can understand ourselves. Because sometimes I think we don't do a very good job of understanding ourselves. As parents, and then <clears throat> what we end up doing is passing on our, our dysfunction and our pain and our, our whatever to the children and then they've got to carry, they got to deal with it. They've got to hopefully break, the, break that chain, break that cycle. But my hope is that today we can look at some of these things and we can say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break that cycle myself. Um, and we're about out of time, but um, I'd like to just go, just for a, a, a scriptural example, Go to the Old Testament <clears throat> and I was just there and I forgot to write the, the reference down, but I'd like to talk about, I'd like to look at Absalom just a little bit and I think it's in 2 Samuel. Is it chapter 14? I think maybe it's 14. Yeah. So <clears throat> Absalom was, as we know, a very entitled, um, arrogant young man. But there's something that comes out to me in chapter 14. And... You know, he had fled because he had, he had murdered his brother Amnon because Amnon had raped his sister Tamar. And he, he came back and he wanted to talk to David, his father. But David ignored him. David refused to talk to him. I don't know why David refused to talk to him, but he did. I have my theories. And... In verse uh, 29, verse 28 of chapter 14, So Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. Therefore Absalom sent for Joab to, ha to have sent him to the king, but he would not come to him. And when he sent again the second time, he would not come. Then he said unto his servants, See, Joab's field is near mine, and he hath barley there. Go and set it on fire. And Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Job arose and came to Absalom to his house and said unto him, Wherefore have thy servants set my field on fire? And Absalom answered Joab, Behold, I have sent unto thee, saying, Come hither, that I may send thee to the king, to say, Wherefore am I come from Geshur? It had been good for me to have been there still. Now therefore let me see the king's face, and if there be any iniquity in me, let him kill me. So this is the level, the level of insistence that Absalom had to see his dad. He could not get an audience with his father. And we can, you know, we can blame him for his arrogance. We can blame him for his childishness or whatever. But the point I'm trying to make is, is this. David ignored his son. And 
He probably had too many sons to take care of properly and also be the king. And so I guess that's maybe the, the first thing I'd like to say is, if you're going to have children, make sure you're going to spend time with them. And I, you know, I speak to myself here, but ignoring somebody is probably the worst form of contempt. Is that a fair statement? It's kind of like, you know, I've heard the statement, a dog would rather you kick him than ignore him. Uh, and I think that's, that's kind, of the truth, it's kind of the truth about children. Have you ever heard of a child who acts up just so he can get attention? I think that happens. And if, if we're parents and that's happening to us, maybe we should pay attention here. So Absalom obviously had, had some hurts, and his main hurt was dad won't even bother to take the time of day to talk to me. And how different would have history have been, possibly, if David would have come to Absalom and said, Son, I'm here, and I'm available to you. Let's talk. What's going on? How are you feeling? Absalom could have unloaded on him how resentful he was that, that he had allowed his sister to be raped, and they could have talked this out. David could have apologized. History could have been a lot different. I don't know. Those are things we never know. The Bible gives us gives us facts. The Bible gives us narratives. I think a lot of things that we read in the, in the Bible, you know, knowing human condition, knowing human hearts, we have, to, we have to draw conclusions, but there's always patterns. There's always patterns. When, when, there is, when there is pain in a person's life, it manifests, it shows up, and the subsequent generation is also hurt. I think, I mean, there's a very, there's a very good narrative also in the life of the patriarchs and I think maybe we'll save that for another day but I'll, I'll just maybe I'll just finish with with this let's turn to Proverbs 4 and verse 1 Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I, good, I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also, and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. This is a father, and fathers, it's your responsibility to teach your children. It is not your wife's responsibility to teach your children. And when we as, as, as dads, as fathers, are struggling with this, I just want to, I guess, speak a word to you. We've inherited it from Adam. <laughs> Um, there's, there's, a, there's a passage in Genesis that I just find really, really instructive in this. You know, it's the, the story of, of Adam and Eve in the garden, and, and the serpent comes to Eve, and she eats the fruit. It says Adam was not deceived. He saw that what was happening. He did nothing to, to step in and, and prevent it. He was passive. And... After the fact, after the fact, it says in verse 7, the eyes of them both were open. Chapter 3, verse 7. The eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, now I want you to just, just pay attention here, dads, because you listen to a message like this so many times, you're tempted to go and just say, man, I just can't. I know what, I know what the word of God says is true. I know that I've failed. I know that 
all this stuff, and you can just heap guilt upon guilt and keep beating yourself up, and it never produces life, it never produces change. But look at the look look at the response. Verse 10. He said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. We as men are always running from that which makes us feel inadequate. We are. And we gravitate towards that which we feel capable, that which, that which we feel good at, that which we know we can do. I would rather be out running a dozer than trying to counsel somebody with a troubled marriage. I really, really would rather be out there running the dozer because I don't know what I'm doing counseling your marriage. And I don't know if I'll do any good or if I'll do more damage than good. I just don't know because I'm not good at it. I don't feel like it's my thing. But am I called to it? I would rather be changing a tire than talking about really personal stuff with somebody and trying to help them. And changing a tire is hard work. But I know I can do it. I know I can accomplish it. I know I can get a good result. And I think the same thing applies to us as, as, as dads. And here's where we have to just humble ourselves and say, Lord, I am not good at this. And I would rather not deal with this. But I know it's got to be done. And I'm just asking you to help me. And first of all, just give me the confidence in knowing that I am your son, knowing that I'm not under condemnation because of Jesus, knowing that if you empower me, I can, I can do anything then you can do it. Because the word of God says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, if you got a son who's disrespectful, if you got a daughter who's rebellious, if you got stuff going on in the home that you don't know what to do with, Look to the Lord and maybe just, just spend some time asking yourself, what is it about me? What am I afraid of? What drives me to constantly make the same mistakes over and over again? Or what, what's, what's making me believe things that aren't really true, that the Word of God says aren't true? What is making me accept the, the, the mindset of this age? Why are these things this way? And then just... Come to the Father and just say, Lord, I know you have my good, my good at, at heart. I know you're my Father. I know that you possess all the wisdom and all the understanding in the world. Just give me some of it. I need it right now. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I don't think we've hardly scratched the surface, but I pray, God, that as a congregation and as families, that you would be merciful to us and you would give us the grace to be honest with ourselves in our marriages, to be honest with each other about what we're afraid of and why we tend to react the way we do. If we're fathers here and we're passive and we can't seem to get ourselves to move in the right direction, Lord, just a prayer, a prayer for healing, Lord. Maybe there's a, there's a hurt. Maybe there's pain there. Maybe there's a need to forgive. Maybe there's bitterness. I don't know, Lord, but I, I feel like there's such a need among us. And it manifests in the lives of our children. It manifests in, in ways that we don't like to see. And so we, we step in and try to correct those things without really addressing the root cause. Help us, Father, to be more wise. Help us to rely on you. Help us to look at your word and humble ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's have a song.
want to thank Brother Felix for the message this morning. Uh, I can say amen to what he shared. There's a, there's a lot of good instruction. As I look at this list back here, and I look at, you know, my life, you know, as a, as a father, I see a lot of places where I've failed. Another, another thing that I had to think of that you could add to that list is uh, forcing, as a parent, forcing your views or opinions on your children. It's also, I think it's quite harmful. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've been very, I've been encouraged by being here and uh, I do wanna ask each one of you to, to pray for me as I lead out in my home that I can do so effectively. I want to open it up. Uh, if there, anyone here who has a word of testimony, the time is yours. Thank you for sharing, Roger. Anyone else?
Anyone else? All right. Uh, ways of announcements. I think the only thing we have is tonight would be the evening for small groups. Uh, there's no prayer meeting on Wednesday night, so it'll be an open week. Are there any other announcements before we close? All right. Uh, yeah. The, uh, I would like to suggest we just keep the members in here a little bit and, and get all their ballots turned in. Okay. Just so we can be sure to get them all. Okay. Uh, after after we have the closing prayer, or whatever, uh, if the members can stay in here, and we'll just make sure we get all the ballots turned in for the uh, the voting that we're doing. Okay. Okay. Well, I will. Uh, we have Abe and Brenda uh, Slayball here. Uh, they have they have shared with us that they want to be a part of our church here. So uh, I'm going to give you guys opportunity to stand and share a testimony. And yeah, time is yours. <laughs> 